the term anti-Semitism was coined uh, by an anti-Semite himself called Wilhelm Ma. Uh, and in 1879, he, uh, he wrote a book called the, the Way to German Victory Over Judaism. Uh, and in that, he, he, he coins this term anti-Semitism. He actually made the, the Anti-Semites League, which he was a, a part of. Uh, and he said that the war between the two, between Germany and Judaism, uh, would be over with the death of one or the other of them. And clearly, he, he favoured Germany uh, in that. Now, as well as this, there are parameters as well. And I, I'd be interested to know what people thought about this. Um, I think that there are two different types of anti-Semitism. Firstly, pre-Christian anti-Semitism. And secondly, post-Christian anti-Semitism. Now, this idea uh, I got mainly from the historian at the bottom there, Jerome Hannes. Uh, he sort of is, is a bit more complex than this, but this is like a, a, a simplified of that. So pre-Christian anti-Semitism, we are talking about here like, um, um, say, ancient history. More like, you know, the, the tribal hatred that was there between sort of, uh, you know, battles between Israel and surrounding neighbours, maybe like the Philistines and so on. It's not necessarily like... Israel were not treated any worse than any of the other nations that came off, off worse in battles. It's more like a sort of a, a warring for, for land and prestige and power and the rest of it. That's like sort of in the general mishmash of ancient history as a whole. But post-Christian anti-Semitism is something very different. And really we're, we're referring here to the time when the Roman Empire became Christian and beyond because... Now the Jews were persecuted in like a, a very specific, a very brutal and an almost twisted way. It became more of a thing about the, the Jews themselves being, you know, sort of parasites or whatever, whatever else it might be in society as being like a, a, a persecuted minority in society as opposed to any of the other sort of racial groups around at the time. Uh, they're, they're hated in, they're like a, in a caricatured way, almost, from this time onwards, because they become, you know, like God killers and, and the rest of it uh, after this time. Uh, a nation that didn't deserve to survive. And it is really, I think, this type of anti-Semitism that has punctuated the pages of history for the most part, like, like after, after, say, the, the, the Common Era time. Um, and it's really this that is our subject for tonight. Now, we have to begin, of course, with a biblical perspective. Uh, so we just read uh, Revelation chapter 17, and we, we don't want to go into detail here at all, except to pick out a, a few uh, main ideas here in Revelation 17. Uh, so just look at your Bibles again, and firstly in verse 5, uh, we read about a woman who was arrayed in purple, right, and, and who's called Babylon the Great. And then in verse 9, it is the, the woman who has, and then the seven heads, which are seven mountains upon which the woman sitteth, yeah? And then verse 18, and the woman which thou sawest is the, is the great city uh, which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Now, of course, the book of Revelation is a book of sign and symbol. So we use the rest of Scripture to understand what Revelation is talking about. Now, a woman, uh, generally in the Bible, portrays the religious aspect of something. So, like, you know, you have, um, uh, like, Christ being the bridegroom, and the ecclesia, or those who follow him, are the bride. They're like the woman. Or you have God is the bridegroom, and Israel is the bride. Or you have an example in Corinthians, we won't turn there, where Paul says that he's going to uh, present the ecclesia or the ecclesia as a chaste virgin to Christ. A woman is like a, a religious aspect of something. Secondly, Babylon. Now, Babylon in scripture appears to be a symbol of two things. And again, that those, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not looking at the verses here, just in general. So if you look in Isaiah, for instance, Isaiah 14, um, if you're interested, it's a symbol of pride, but also a symbol of persecution of God's people. And you see that um, in verse 6. So it says Babylon the Great, right? And in the same breath almost, we read, and the woman was drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Christ. So this idea of Babylon is, is associated with persecution. 
And just as one other example of that, come to Psalm 137, uh, back in the Old Testament. Psalm 137, and this was written um, with the idea of the captivity of the Jewish people in mind. So it says in verse um, 5, If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, and this is the Jewish people speaking while they were in captivity. And then verse 7, Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom in the day of Jerusalem, who said, Raise it, raise it to the foundation thereof. This is talking about Jerusalem. Children of Edom hated Israel, hated Jerusalem, wanted it destroyed. And what are they called? They are called, O daughter of Babylon, which art to be destroyed. In Scripture, in the Bible generally, Babylon is like this, this persecuting, like this, this something that is antagonistic to the people of God, both to those who, who follow Jesus and um, to the, the, the people of Israel, to, to the Jewish people as well. Seven mountains. The, the, the woman sits on seven mountains, we're told. And I put there, you know, this is a clue as to, as to where we're going with this. Um, well, we'll come back to this. And then verse 18 the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigns over the kingdoms of the earth. So John is told the meaning of the vision. The woman is, in the time, John is the writer of Revelation, of course, um, in the time when John lives, the great city reigns over the kingdoms of the earth. And of course, we, we think of the extent of the Roman Empire. This is the only great city in the time of John which reigned over the kings of the earth. And in fact, the only city in the time of John who was built upon seven hills, uh, Rome. And in fact, I was thinking about this, and even from a historical perspective, this makes sense um, in the way that if you know, John was imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos by Rome, John had watched his friends being persecuted by Rome. Is it any surprise that when we come to Revelation, a book that he's written, he foretells the destruction of a city which reigns over the earth built on seven mountains? It's almost like not very subtle, which is obviously the, the, the purpose intended here. Now bear that in mind. A parallel passage, just turn with me to 2 Thessalonians 2. If you've been to Christadelphian lectures before, you may, you may have heard this passage being mentioned. So we're talking in the letters again. It's a smaller letter. And it's talking about similar ideas. And again, we just want to pull up, pull up a few ideas from this chapter. Again, no detail particularly. Firstly, verse 3. And in fact, we might say that 2 Thessalonians as a whole is referring to the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is, that is what it's about. And then this is like the things leading up to that and so on. But it's about the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we read in verse 3, For the day shall not come, that is the day of Christ's return, except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin shall be revealed. The man of sin comes from a falling away from um, the original first century Christians. Verse 4, And this man of sin opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And this is the same as Revelation 17. In, do you remember we, we mentioned the pride of Babylon. This is like everything that is antagonistic to God. It's like set yourself above God. That is the pride of Babylon, particularly in Isaiah 14, uh, if, you, if you have a look there later. And another thing, this falling away mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2 is only destroyed when the Lord Jesus Christ returns, which is, of course, a future from now. So verse 8, <clears throat> whom the Lord shall consume with the, with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. So we said, to summarize, the man of sin comes from the falling away of first century Christians. So the, 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 the institutions that the Apostle Paul set up. Uh, secondly, it is something that claims to be God and opposes 
the God of the Bible, just as Babylon did of old. And this is despite having its origins in first century Christianity. And this falling away is a system that survives until Jesus returns. And here we're not, obviously we're going, there's a lot more we could say about either of these two passages. This is like, a, this is like an overall view here. So as a whole, from the two passages, firstly, we're talking about a religious system, the woman, an organization that originated from the city that reigned over the earth in the time of John, i.e. Rome, a city that is built on seven hills, Rome, a power that persecutes God's people. And it comes from the falling away of first century Christianity. Now note here, the interesting thing is that there are two origins of this system that we're talking about. Firstly, Rome in Revelation, and secondly, original Christianity in Second Thessalonians. There are two origins of the system. A system that survives until the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not sure what we're talking about yet, um, I've put this quote on the screen. This is written by a Christadelphian, uh, and this was mainly where a lot of my ideas came from um, for this subject tonight. I, I thoroughly recommend it as a read. Um, Brother Jason Hensley wrote it from California. Um, and I'll just read this quote. Babylon was a terrible persecutor of God's people. And so was the Catholic Church. Year after year, the church was, <coughs> was characterized by a virulent loathing for Abraham's natural descendants. Babylonian thinking and this hatred against the Jewish people has continued through the Catholic Church. Over and over, they have participated in or been instigators of these activities. These have, they have despised the Jews and sought to destroy them. Truly, the Catholic, in the Catholic Church, Babylon the Great and its spirit of persecution is alive and well today. And so what we're talking about today is, is, is the persecution of the Jews by the, by the church, particularly the, the Roman Catholic Church. And there are two perspectives, really, for our, our topic this evening. And the first one is, <coughs> is simple. Um, the Roman Catholic persecution of the Jews is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. This adds to the credibility of the biblical narrative. So just as in the Old Testament, which we, we, we talk about a lot, that the prophecies that were fulfilled, um, maybe to do with the return of Israel or so on, so the same is true of the New Testament prophecies, of the, the prophecies that say the Apostle Paul made in 2 Thessalonians, or the prophecy of uh, John in Revelation 17. It adds to the credibility of the biblical narrative. Secondly, our beliefs impact our actions. History demands this to be so. And this is particularly true of the Catholic Church, I think, because of three things that they believe. Number one, the Trinity. So they believe that God and Jesus are the same, a thing that, again, is not taught in, um, in Scripture itself. But this meant that when um, Jesus was killed, the Jews became the killers of God himself. And that motivated centuries and centuries of bishops, of lay people, of anyone to, to go after the Jews. That belief impacted actions right down through history. Secondly, replacement theology, the idea that the church has taken the place of the Jewish people. Again, something that's false, we, you know, that we believe that the Bible talks about the everlasting love that God has for his people and how his covenant with them will never be broken. Well, the church believes, of course, that in fact it has been and they are the people of God. And because of that, the Jews are nobodies who failed. Everything went wrong. They are like, um, there's, a, there's a term for them in, in history um, where it's like um, they have to be there to show what happened when it went wrong but they can't get high in society because then it would be good for them. So they're like always at this lower, you know, like strata all the way through. Um, and that is really because of this. And thirdly, oh, I've gone back. Oh, my. Sorry. 
Thirdly, um, the church is God's kingdom on earth. This is a smaller one, but still true. So we believe in the return of Christ to the earth in the future to reestablish the kingdom of Israel and to rule from Jerusalem. The church believes that it is the kingdom of God. And this is like an imperative for action. It means like, you know, kill the infidel. Let's go get, you know, get the Jews. Um, and particularly this is true in the Middle Ages, of course, where with, with, the, with the Pope having actual power. Um, but again, it, it, it massively affected uh, what happened in history. So when we look at the history tonight, um, firstly, Roman Catholic persecution is a fulfillment of New Testament Bible prophecy. Secondly, it is like a demonstration that our beliefs impact our actions. History demands this to be so. Now, the next few slides, um, they're a bit dense, I'm sorry. Uh, it's, <laughs> the idea is to get an overview. Please don't worry about like, all the individual dates or anything. It's more like to get a general feel of what's going on. And so we're talking about this idea, like we said, a post-Christian anti-Semitism. So after the Roman Empire became Christian, what happened to the Jewish people? So again, it's, it's dense, but just bear with me. So lots of things all at once. Constantine, Emperor Constantine, takes the throne, converts to Christianity, and all of this happens. Intermarriage forbidden between Jews and Christians. Legislation prevents Jews from owning slaves. Conversion punishable by death. Um, Jews and Christian celebrations all like separated apart, got to be separate because we can't have our, you know, Christians mixing with those lot. Uh, this is cool. This is a bit later, a few, 20 years later after Constantine, a man who was surnamed by the Romans, the apostate, actually decided, oh, I don't like Catholicism. And what he did then was actually not be so harsh to the Jews and actually said, oh, you can go and return and build your temple, which they didn't do. But you see, you take Catholicism out of the equation and suddenly they were nicer to the Jews. Council of Laodicea, same again. Separate the festivals. You can't keep the Sabbath with the Jews. Um, Jews barred from civil service, from the army, from legal professions, loads of other things as well. You know, this is just like a, like the, a, a smallest summary ever. Uh, deicide is then termed, which is again a really important thing. The Jews are the people who've killed God because of the Trinity. This made a massive difference uh, in, in persecution terms. Anti-Jewish edicts in Visigothic Spain. Now, we'll come back to that. That sounds a bit obscure. But even in, in the far place of Spain, when the Roman Catholic Church got involved, suddenly all of this anti-Jewish um, decrees, action starts to take place. We move on in history, Middle Ages, after the collapse of Roman civilization. First Crusade. You'd think that the Crusades would be about taking Jerusalem. Now, the most part of the Crusades in reality and history were about killing the Jews because you get all of the, like, the, the real knights who actually go to Jerusalem and all of the other people who want to who wanna, like, prove they're crusaders but couldn't make it just kill all the Jews in Europe. Jewish communities destroyed along the Rhine. Uh, in history, they're called the Rhineland Massacres, if you look them up. It's insane. It's just crazy. And that was, again, motivated by the church. Second Crusade, same thing, but in France. Third Crusade, same thing in England. Uh, Fourth Lateran Council. You'd have thought that um, Jewish, anti-Jewish legislation like this only came with Nazi Germany. Not true. Way before this, uh, Jews wear distinguishable clothing, like, like, a, like a badge, a yellow badge, incidentally, or a hat. Not just in Nazi Germany. Hundreds of years before, instigated by the church. Jews expelled from England, France, Austria. That's just a little box. The truth is they were expelled from almost everywhere in Europe. 100,000 Jews killed by Christian knights. Jews become the scapegoat for the Black Death. Again, a massive thing because of how already like the subhuman strata of, of life that they were part of in Europe meant that the Black Death was their fault for the most part. Um, blood libel. This means that um, after having killed Christ, the Jews are now blamed on for like sucking Christian children's blood. Move on. So 1453 is when the fall of Constantinople happened. And then that really ushers in the early modern period of, of European history. Spanish Inquisition, again, massive in Spain. Catholic Church instigated this, of course. Jews were, were killed, persecuted, forced to convert, and eventually expelled. They mostly went to the Ottoman Empire. 
in fact. <laughs> That's uh, the canonization of Simon Trent. He was a young Christian boy who was found dead, and it was assumed by the population that, in fact, the Jews had done this. Um, and so he was made a saint by the Pope because, you know, the Jews had sucked his blood and, and everything else. Again, that's like a small one, but representative of an era. Martin Luther. Now, again, this is important because you think here is the birth of Protestant, Protestantism. You know, they're like away from the Catholic Church. And yet they remained the same for the most part with regard to the, the doctrine of anti-Semitism. They kept the Trinity and they kept anti-Semitism. Martin Luther writes on the Jews and their lies. 1543. You think again, first ghetto, it wasn't established in Nazi Germany, hundreds of years before, established in Rome by Pope Paul IV. Uh, this is from, a, from a, um, a historian. He says, the anti-Semitism of the modern period was even worse than that of the Middle Ages. And nowhere was this more obvious in, than in those areas which roughly encompass modern day Germany, what he really, that, what we're talking about then is like Christian ish sort of Europe, and particularly among the Lutherans, among the Christians. Move on, late modern period, age of enlightenment, right? French Revolution. So the Catholic Church is thrown out, and similar to before, almost like for, for like a shaky little bit of time throughout the Catholic Church, and suddenly the Jews have rights, and it's like, yes, we're free for a bit. But that didn't last long, of course, because that's not how it goes. And actually, you know, all the way through this time, there are, there are many uh, calls from the Catholics, you know, reverse this, this sort of, this, this type of thing. Uh, here again, um, a bit later, 1840, this man, a, a Catholic, argues against Jewish financial aristocracy, and he calls them a deicidal people who wants to enslave the Christians. The Dreyfus Affair, you may have, you may have heard of this, um, so uh, 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 an officer, a French officer, was wrongly accused of treason. And he was put on trial, and the whole of France was like whipped up against him. And basically that became Theodore Herzl's inspiration, because he saw the whole of France and he was like, this is, you know, it is impossible for the Jews to find a home place here when the whole of France is whipped up against one Jew who did nothing wrong. And really, the bed for that is found in, in, because of the Christian beliefs of France. And so Herzl goes home and he writes his book, The Jewish State. And then, you know, the Zionist Congress and all of that begins. But that is like one of the catalysts in history. Beyond this, Russia, we haven't really talked about Russia, but the first pogrom in Russia, and there was much anti-Semitism before this as well, but first pogrom in Odessa. And this was instigated by the Greek Orthodox Church. So in the West, you have the Roman Catholic Church. In the East, you had Constant Constantinople, right, where and Istanbul, the Eastern Roman Empire, which only fell in 1453. Well, the church associated with that is the Greek Orthodox Church. Similar idea, they instigate the first Russian pogrom. More Russian pogroms in later on. And this, the, the population that were persecuted here become the basis for the first aliyah of the people who returned to the land of Israel um, at the time. And the May laws, those laws are very similar to the laws that were made by Constantine, same idea, later on in history. And then, of course, well, we've made massive jumps here, but the Holocaust. Um, this is like almost the climax of everything that had gone before, but it's like the preparation had already been done for such an insane thing to happen in Europe. Actually, it's stay here for now um, and again this is like sort of an overview again we, we want to keep in mind you know that the two things we're talking about here is number one that the the, the persecution of the Jews through history uh, adds to the credibility of the biblical narrative because it was prophesied that a falling away from true Christianity would persecute God's people in such a way Revelation talks about it from the perspective of persecuting the saints, like the true Christians, but the idea of Babylon is much deeper than that. It's God's people as well, and this is this aspect of it. And secondly, you can see actions like our beliefs, no, our actions are, are affected by what we believe. It does matter what we believe. Now, you may be wondering... Um, 
about maybe Arab anti-Semitism and, and particularly in, in Muslim countries. Now, I, I only I came across this last night and I haven't properly thought about this yet, but I thought this was cool nonetheless, so I thought I'd put it on. Um, this is from the Oxford Handbook of, the Ju of Jewish Studies. He, uh, Mark Cohen, so he's obviously Jewish, but he says that most scholars conclude that Arab anti-Semitism in the modern world arose in the 19th century against the backdrop of conflicting Jewish and Arab nationalisms, and it was primarily imported into the Arab world by nationalistically minded Arab, no, Christian Arabs, and only subsequently was it Islamized. And I think there's truth to that. And I think there's also truth that when we're talking about anti-Semitism on like the broad scale of human history, it was, it, 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 like the, what the Muslims had to do with it is a lot smaller in comparison with like the Christians and like the main bulk of anti-Semitism. And I think at least most Jews would agree with that as a, despite the Arab conflict in Israel today. And of course, it is no different today. Um, obviously not in terms like the Holocaust, but the same thing survives. There's like an anti-Semitic culture in, in Europe's Christian roots, and you, you can still see it. Uh, there, there are just a few I found, like five, in five minutes. There's tons of it. So for the remainder of our time, uh, I had three case studies in history which I thought really represented um, like the whole of history, like, like they really helped to see what it was like. Uh, and you'll be pleased to know that they're only like about five minutes each, so don't worry, um, there's, there's, there's not that much. But number one, we talked about it earlier, is when Constantine converts to Christianity, so about 300 CE. Number two, a few hundred years later, this might seem obscure, but I think this is really interesting, this one, uh, the anti-Jewish edicts in Visigothic Spain. So we'll, we'll come on to that. And number three, of course, the Holocaust. So, number one, uh, Constantine uh, converting to Christianity. And we need to talk, of course, about the Battle of Milvian Bridge. And again, to cut a long story short, so Constantine marches on Rome um, to defeat a guy called Maxentius in a battle to be emperor of Rome. And the night before, it's alleged he sees a vision of the cross, as you can see here on the screen, right? And, and, the, cross, and the cross, it's got like a, a symbol above it, and it says, I'm Toto Nica, which is like Nike there. It's like, in this, conquer. And suddenly, Constantine was like, oh yeah, I've done it all wrong. From now, we should be Christian. And so his army emblazons crosses on their shields, and they become like the Christian army of Constantine. And... They defeat Maxentius in the Battle of the Milvian Bridge over the Tiber, and they go into Rome and establish a new empire. Um, well, it's obviously the same, but like now with Christianity like at its head. And having become Christian and won the battle at Milvian Bridge, uh, Constantine then holds a council. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly of how, what the time periods are here, but he holds the Council of Nicaea. Uh, to talk about you know, how Christianity is going to work in Rome. And you'll see this isn't a historical uh, source at all, it's just the Jerusalem Post, but I think they still express these ideas really nicely. Um, so we'll read it. Um, the Nicene Council set the new imperial religion on the wrong track. It condemned Sabbath-keeping, which is what we said before. It like, makes this separation between Jews and Christians proper and established what Constantine called the Venerable Day of the Sun, Sunday. Sun worship had, be, had been part of Roman worship since the collapse of the classical pantheon in the first centuries. It also banned the Passover and substituted the pagan Easter. From the first to third centuries, Roman imperial religious Caesars wanted to extinguish Christianity by deaths, slavery or by disinformation. If the Roman authorities could not kill Christianity, the next best thing was to assimilate it into the pagan system. You get the idea. Uh, I put that last bit on more as a footnote because it's similar to what we were saying before, right? There are two um, origins for sort of the Roman Catholic Church, this, this falling away that we heard about. Firstly, Rome, and secondly, a falling away from Christianity. It's like two things amalgamated in one which caused um, this persecution. 
But this Nicene Council is known, and you'll see the title there, how the Council of Nicaea intensified anti-Semitism. It is known as like a big, from this point onwards sort of thing. Historians sort of recognize this, um, particularly when they write about the Holocaust later on. This is sort of, you know, the, the beginnings of, you might call it the beginnings of post-Christian anti-Semitism. Um, and so this is it, this is like, this case study, that's all we want to say about it, but what we're saying is that Christianity is added into this, into the mix, and the ideas of the Trinity, you know, like killing God and replacement theology, and suddenly persecution on the Jews happens at the same time. Case study number two, the Visigoths. Now, um, they came from um, sort of, I think Germany sort of area. Uh, if you look down at the bottom, I don't have a pointer, oh, actually. So the Visigoths are here, uh, and we're looking at this line. So they start up there, and then they go down, and then down actually into the bootleg of Italy itself, into Rome, and then onwards into Spain. But a bit of background, um, so they're in, the, the Visigoths are a Germanic tribe who actually did not believe in the Trinity. They were Christians, funnily enough, but didn't believe in the Trinity. And for that reason, one of the reasons, they hated Rome. And that is a big motivator in why they came down to attack Rome in the first place. And they play a massive part in the fall of the Roman Empire. So they, they go down, they attack Rome, they sack the whole of Rome, move through Italy, and then carry on through and actually settle in the Iberian Peninsula in Spain, on, down, over there. And they form the Visigothic Kingdom from about the 5th to maybe the 8th century um, CE, that type of, of time frame. And as we said, they're Christian, but crucially, they did not believe uh, in the Trinity. And yet, however, I think in about 600 AD, one king decides that actually now is the time to convert to Catholicism. And so he sends across to Rome and he converts properly, like signs a paper, says, we believe in the Trinity. And you'll never guess what happened. It's like, you know, the zeal of the convert. We've got to prove that we are true Roman Catholics he persecutes all the Jews in Spain. And we get the, the, what, we, what we said before, the, the anti-Jewish edicts of the Visigothic Empire. And this, like, from now they were, again, tortured, tried to convert, told to get lost. Like, in Spain, it was bad from that point onwards. And incidentally, it was bad until the Muslims invaded in about 700 AD, and then it was like, phew, and then the Jews are fine again. And in fact, once the Muslims came, it ushered in a period which is known in history as the Golden Age because of the way that Muslims and Jews and actually Christians interacted under the hierarchy of the Muslims there in Spain. Uh, so again, it's like you put the idea of the Trinity into the equation, like this idea side, and suddenly the Jews are persecuted. This is the same. Um, this is again, it's, it's, this is Bible prophecy being fulfilled in that sense. Um, this, this is the, the church fulfilling the, the Babylon power that Revelation had talked about back in 96 AD. And so we come to the Holocaust. And again, um, <laughs> there is so much we could say about this. We're not at all. I just, all I want to do really is read this quote to you and maybe one other thing. Um, I found this, it was a book called, it was just called The Jews. And it's like a history of the Jewish people. And the man who wrote it is Howard Fast. And you may have heard of it. He wrote books. Um, he wrote a book about the history of America and the history of Britain. And I think one about the history of trading. And then he turned his attention to the Jews. And he has this to say about the Holocaust. While many forces joined together throughout European history to use and promote anti-Semitism, the fact must be faced and stated bluntly that anti-Semitism in the European diaspora of the Jew was the child and ideology of the Roman Catholic Church and the Greek Catholic Church. In the ecumenical spirit of today, many Jews feel it is best to tone down such matters and forget. But history cannot be both written and forgotten. And still others, Christians, say 
But surely you cannot blame the Nazi murder of six million Jews upon the church. Surely the church never countenanced it. Far worse. From the church, the church from its very inception, organized anti-Semitism in a modern clerical guise, spared no effort to inoculate the entire Catholic population with it and gave it to the German pagans alongside Christianity as if to prove as if to provide a perennial outlet for the blood and murder sickness that has been a part of Germany as long as Germany has been a part of history. And I think this, this is right. Christianity provided the seedbed for the Holocaust. We think of, of Rome, and this, uh, I found this in, in Yad Vashem in Israel. It's like Yad Vashem is sort of like there as if <laughs> just to make sure that the European nations never forget what happened. It's like, you know, just stood defiantly there. It's never going to go. And it's got all of these quotes in it, just so that it's memorialized and there. And in it is this poem um, that is written about the Pope. While the ovens were fed by day and by night, the most holy father who dwells in Rome did not leave his palace with crucifix high to witness one day a pogrom, just to stand there one day where the child lamb is standing each day anew the anonymous child of a Jew. I think that this case study as well shows the same thing. Number one, as, as we said, that this is a fulfillment of New Testament Bible prophecy. And number two, what we believe impacts the way that we act. And particularly in these, in these false beliefs that the, that the Roman Catholic Church held about the word of God. And so we, we come to the end of, of what we have to say uh, tonight. Um, this is just a summary. So you know, the church and anti-Semitism, we began in Revelation 17 and 2 Thessalonians 2, and we noted the, the sort of the dual aspect of the origins of the system that would persecute the Jews. Firstly, in Rome, and secondly, in the falling away from true Christianity. And then we thought about the history. So the general sweep, which I don't know if it was useful, I hope it was. Um, but then in terms of the case studies, firstly, Emperor Constantine, secondly, Visigothic Spain, and thirdly, the Holocaust. And we also thought in the same, at the same time about the teaching, right? So the Trinity replacement theology and the church, I think, are the main ones that really had an impact on the way that history happened. And as a result, beliefs impact actions. This is, this is definitely the case. History demands this to be so. And so I just, I just wanted to finish with, with this verse from Corinthians. Again, there's no need to turn it up. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now, the only bit that's important there is just the last bit in blue, the simplicity that is in Christ. Um, you know, we've spoken about a lot of history, and sadly, a lot of, a lot of negative history, so I apologize. This is the positive bit, and, and that is that the gospel message preached by the apostles is simple, the, the simplicity that is in Christ, we read. It, it's like a, a simple message that began in the Old Testament and continues through uh, into, into Christ and the work of the apostles. So, you know, <laughs> next time you, you open your Bible, um, don't pick up a dusty commentary that's read by some church father. Um, just, just read the Bible um, by itself. You know, read about God's everlasting love for his people. Um, read about a one God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and we, we can read about the return of Christ uh, and his coming kingdom, you know, the, the reestablishment of the kingdom of Israel. 